can I do? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rira, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with uh, Dr. Maura Dolan, who is here to present their book, Boneheads and Brainiacs. Uh, we're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community, especially during uh, this troubled time. Uh, before I properly introduce uh, Dr. Dolan, I do have some quick announcements and some guidelines I'd like to share with you all. Um, our next Romans Live event is scheduled for Wednesday, May 20th at 6 p.m. with author Kevin O'Leary, who will be presenting their book, Madison's Sorrow. Uh, for regular updates on our virtual events in the near future, please check out our calendar on our website as well as our social media handles. Also, some good news, our bookstores on Colorado Boulevard and Hastings Ranch will uh, be offering curbside pickup. Uh, you can browse through our online catalog on our website. And uh, this evening's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you see a question on the list you'd like for Dr. Dolan to answer, please click the Like button. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please consider supporting our bookstore by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. Uh, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen, and the link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. Uh, we are selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Hummingbird for those interested. And with those guidelines out of the way, let me introduce um, our guest speaker for this evening. Uh, Dr. Moira Dolan has been licensed as a medical doctor since 1985 and a certified inter internal medicine specialist since 1988. She has also served as a consultant on fraud and disability cases for the state of Texas Department of Insurance, the Texas Department of Assistive and Rehabilita Rehabilitative Services, Medicare and other organizations. Her mission is to help educate people on how to preserve their rights and inform themselves fully of the risks and benefits of medications or medical treatment. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Dr. Dolan. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you, Rira. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's attending, but especially thank you to Vromans. You're really, um, I can tell you, I was on a book, to book, book uh, tour when the COVID restrictions hit and Vromans was really at the forefront of those who converted over to video conferencing for these author events very early on, an early adopter. And I'm sure all the independent authors uh, appreciate you. So support your local bookstores, guys. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, this, this, is about the book Boneheads and Brainiacs, which I subtitled Heroes and Scoundrels of the Nobel Prize in Medicine to give you more of an idea of what we're, what we're talking about here. And, you know, when I, when I first wrote, got into researching for this book, it was really for my own interest. You know, what is the Nobel Prize all about? I actually had a patient who helped with some Nobel Prize winning research on vitamin B12 and uh, it, it just gave me a lot of interest in the Nobel Prize. I also admired some of the Nobel Prize winners in other subjects, such as Nobel Peace Prize winner Albert Schweitzer, who was a medical missionary into the deepest reaches of Af Africa in the 1940s and the 1950s. And he won a Nobel Peace Prize for, for his philosophy of the reverence for life. So my initial idea of the Nobel Prize and Nobel laureates was was this lofty organization and, and the brightest of the bright and, and the geniuses out of us all. But then when I actually started to research the Nobel Prize, I found some things that actually did reflect some aspects of the practice of medicine that weren't all that lofty and noble. For example, did you know that Alfred Nobel was the inventor of dynamite? In fact, by the time he died, he had over 350 patents, most of them having to do with more lethal ways to kill someone. And this is where he made his fortune. At, in, at some point, one of his brothers died. He was in Paris at the time, Nobel was in Paris. And a Paris newspaper ran a headline 
the warmonger is dead. And Alfred Nobel realized that he had a legacy that he had to fix. And so that is when he started to cook on this idea of a Nobel Prize. And by the time he died, his will bequeathed something like 94% uh, of his, his considerable wealth to um, fund the Nobel Prize. And here you could see a picture of uh, a cartridge of dynamite, and that was his, <coughs> excuse me, signature on there and the stamp of his, his factory. He was the inventor of dynamite. So it's very interesting that the Nobel Prizes in medicine, literature, uh, peace, physics, chemistry, um, yeah, really come out of this legacy. Now, there's also a Nobel Prize in economics that came around later, and it's funded a little bit differently. Um, but the, the core Nobel Prizes were the ones that he established and in his will. Um, so, yeah, you know, right from the beginning, we see something that's maybe less than noble about the Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Um, I want to give Rear an opportunity to jump in here anytime. If you don't stop me, I'll just keep going. I'd like to share with you some of the boneheads. You want to hear about them? So the very first Nobel Prize really established some precedents that we, we see themes running through all of the Nobel Prizes. This was given to Emil Adolf von Behring in 1901. And uh, one of the things that he's known for is having cheated two of his research partners. Now, this is a little bit of an artifact of what Alfred Nobel stipulated in his will about how this Nobel Prize uh, winners are determined. And it, it can only be given to a maximum of three individuals in any one year. Now, I'm talking specifically about the rules around the Nobel Prize in medicine. Um, there, there, there are slightly different rules in the other prizes. Um, it, it can't be given to a group. Um, uh, and, and again, you'll see in the Peace Prize, like I have a friend who is, who is among um, Doctors Without Borders when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to them. But the prize in medicine can't be given to a group. Um, what von Behring did, he had a research partner by the name of Shibasaburo, a Japanese national, um, who had helped him to discover, who, who himself, I'm sorry, had, had discovered the diphtheria toxin and antitoxin and in von Behring's lab, but von Behring took the entire credit for it. Um, in fact, a Japanese national would not win the Nobel Prize in medicine until 1987. So especially in the early years, we see tremendous nationalism and racism coming into determining supposedly the uh, most award-worthy medical researcher in the world. Um, it was very much uh, European-centered, and after the first few years, we started to see it also involve um, America, but um, very few other nationalities were were, rec were, were uh, recognized. Now, von Behring also cheated another partner named Paul Ehrlich, who himself would go on to win his own Nobel Prize in later years. What happened was in, in order to monetize their discoveries, they made arrangements, financial arrangements with Hirsch Pharmaceutical, a big pharmaceutical company in Germany. Again, setting a precedent for Nobel Prize winners to profit off of their discoveries that were made while they were in academic institutions. And Paul Ehrlich assisted von Behring in making the uh, diphtheria antitoxin uh, process in a way that could be um, put into large scale production for human use. And again, um, when that deal was arranged by von Behring, he got something like 92% of the profits and left his partner Ehrlich with only 8%. Don't feel too bad for Ehrlich because in years later, Ehrlich went and did the same thing to his research partner in a different deal on a different substance with a different pharmaceutical company. <laughs> so, you know, we see all this um, going on in the very first Nobel Prize and it's a re recurring theme throughout the years. Um, now, each of these characters who won the prize had their own little personal foibles. 
and um, some of these were were just personality quirks. Uh, others were actually criminals or Nazis. But it turned out that von Bering's issue was was really just mental illness. Now, um, when when I read the contemporary reports, I see that. Uh, von Bering had mental exhaustion, as it was called in those days, and was um, checked into a sanatorium. Now, what we think of as a mental institution is not likely what he checked into. It was probably more of a resort-like thing where people literally went for a rest. However, the official Nobel Prize website uh, actually says that he was in a mental institution for more than a year. There is a New York Times article that I have quoted in the book where um, it, it, it's headlined, um, Professor von Bering denies that he is insane, you know, so just went there for a rest. Uh, so <laughs> we see all kinds of, uh, you know, personal factors coming in, you know, the lives of these, you know, very human, human researchers. Now, the second Nobel Prize was given to Ronald Ross. And he was a piece of work. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, he brought four libel suits against people that he was imagining were maligning his character. He was ultimately, ultimately fired from his university position because he was so abrasive. He wrote an entire book downplaying the role of his former mentor, Patrick, um, Patrick Manson, who, who really led the um, research in the 1800s and early 1900s in the field of tropical medicine. And he, this, this book that Ronald Ross wrote really minimized the, the contributions of, of Dr. Manson. He was really not a nice guy. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize for determining the route of malaria transmission, which was a huge problem in that day. Um, unfortunately, he got the mosquito species wrong um, he got the wrong malaria parasite. Uh, he actually discovered what we found out later was bird malaria, um, the, the type of parasite that, that goes through birds. And it's a whole different mosquito than what would bite a human. Uh, nevertheless, he got the Nobel Prize for it. Now, there was another Nobel Prize given a few years later in 1907 to Alphonse Laverin, um, also regarding malaria research. Now, Laverin got it right. Interesting thing is that Laverne's discoveries predated Ross's discoveries. So why did Ronald Ross get, get it, his prize before Laverne? Again, lots of politics and favoritism and, um, you know, academic infighting and uh, things like that go into the determination of the Nobel Prize. Um, now, Another interesting character was this guy, Alexis Carroll, 1912 Nobel Prize. He got the Nobel Prize for a sewing technique. His mom was a, was a seamstress, and he studied embroidery as a young man. Um, he decided to go to medical school and study how to get vessels to, um, to sew together uh, in a way that wouldn't, let the blood, wouldn't cause the blood to clot and wouldn't constrict constrict the vessels. Um, and um, he, his techniques are actually still in use today. And eventually they made modern organ transplants possible because you really have to be able to connect a lot of vessels in order to, to be able to transplant an organ into a body. Uh, but he was not well liked. He couldn't get a job at his home medical institute in France. He decided to shelve his whole career and become a cattle rancher in Canada. But just about that time, the Rockefeller interest took an in, uh, Rockefeller Institute in America took an interest in him, and he continued his studies. Now he wrote a book called *Man: The Unknown*, in which he uh, advised what was wrong with the world and advised some remedies for it. And I'm just going to read you a little bit straight from *Boneheads and Brainiacs* of what he said in Man the Unknown. He said, eugenics is indispensable for the perpetuation of the strong. A great race must propagate its best elements. It is known that children born in families of superior people are more likely to be a superior type than those born in an inferior family. And he advised those who have murdered, robbed while armed with automatic pistol or machine gun, kidnapped children, 
despoiled the poor of their savings, misled the public on important matters, should be humanely and economically disposed of in small euthanistic institutions supplied with proper gases. Wrote that in 1932. So here he was <laughs> predicting the use of the gas chamber. This was one of our fantastic Nobel Prize winners. I have to say, a sewing technique made modern organ transplant possible. So um, thus the title, Boneheads and Brainiacs. And part of the reason that this is this is, a, this is a message that I'd really like people to hear today is because in this era of all kinds of um, scientists from lofty institutions uh, whispering in the ear of government officials and helping to establish public policy during times of climate change and global pandemics, it's really wise for the smart healthcare consumer to develop a healthy skepticism to you know, really be able to evaluate who are these talking heads with all the initials behind their names. And just because somebody comes from some well-respected institution and has a Nobel Prize that they're trailing around <laughs> does not necessarily mean they're the guy that we want to be advising our governments. And I hope that through reading the stories in this book, there's a chapter for each year of the Nobel Prizes from 1901 to 1950. I'm hard at work on book two right now. That'll bring us up to the year 2000. Um, I hope that by reading the book, people can begin to develop what I call a healthy skepticism and be able to get some discernment around, you know, who they should really listen to and not just kind of become a nodding head just because the guy you know, is from a lofty medical institution or, you know, head of a department or the National Institute of Health or any place like that, right? <laughs> um, now, there's one Nobel Prize winner that when I go around and talk about this book, so many people are surprised that this fella even won a prize. We pretty much all know the name Pavlov. Ivan Petrovich Pavlov won the 1904 Nobel Prize not for um, his behavioral modification techniques, but for a popular digestive remedy. In fact, what he would do would be to take large dogs, put them up on tables, and strap them so that they were in a harness that was attached to a beam on the ceiling above them so that they were immobilized. He would have done an operation to block off their swallowing tube and made an opening here on their cheeks so that when they were teased with bowls of food after having been starved, that the saliva that they generated would be collected by this tube here, and wouldn't go down their throats. And this became a, a best-selling popular digestive remedy and funded his subsequent behavioral modification research. Uh, he did experiments not only on dogs, but on orphans, on asylum inmates, most of whom were political prisoners, and on, um, you know, anybody who was deemed mentally ill. And of course, in those days, there was not, nothing called informed consent or informed refusal. <laughs> and these were the uh, experimental populations. I have to say that happened not only in Russia. That same type of thing happened in the United States and all across Europe, but he took particular advantage of it. Uh, so yeah, he was not a nice guy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can find a slide that, that mentions him. There, there we go. Can we see that? Um, yeah, this is a picture of the same dog experiment done in kids. So you see an operation had been done in this child's cheek and that food is being held at the child's mouth, but he's not being allowed to consume it. And they're collecting the saliva. Now, what this was supposed to prove, God only knows. Uh, I don't have a lot of pictures, uh, black and white pictures of heads of these Nobel winners, but I thought that the picture of um, this fellow was was really interesting. This is a real character. This is Julius Warner Warreg. He was tried 
he, he was um, a medic in World War I in the Austrian army. And um, one of his jobs was to deal with the punishment of the poor young recruits who sometimes were as young as 14 years old who were drafted into the army and tried to flee the front. They used to shoot them, but they began to lose more soldiers from shooting them <laughs> than from enemy fire. So he stepped in, and he, the only psychiatrist actually to win the Nobel Prize, with a unique uh, diversionary method of people who are claiming battle fatigue or what they called shell shock. In those days, we call it PTSD these days, or these youngsters who try to run away from the front. And what he did is he would uh, electroshock them, electroshock their genitals, electroshock their nipples, um, and, and other select treatments. He was actually tried for war crimes in 1919. One of the people who was his juniors in his department of psychiatry at um, at uh, University of Austria was um, Freud, and Freud actually testified in Warner uh, Warreg's behalf, and he ended up not getting convicted of war crimes. Now his Nobel Prize was for a malaria. For, I'm sorry, was for a treatment for syphilis. Syphilis comes in three stages, and the third stage of syphilis, which a minority of patients progress to, but without antibiotic treatment in those days, there were some people who went all the way to the third stage of syphilis, and that infects the brain, and, hit, and it causes dementia, and the insane asylums were filling up with third stage syphilis patients who had uh, syphilis-induced dementia. And he thought, well, it seems like two diseases cannot coexist in the same brain. So what we're going to do is give the blood of malaria patients directly to these syphilis patients and get the malaria to drive the syphilis, you know, out of the brain. This was a variation of what's called pyrotherapy, meaning fever therapy, cause a high temperature, which malaria does, and maybe it will burn out the bad bugs. Well, most of them died. Um, however, he got the Nobel Prize before this really was evaluated fully in larger studies by independent researchers and found very quickly to be uh, a deadly type of treatment. So again, why is, this, why is this pertinent today? Well, we've got, you know, hydroxychloroquine being recommended for COVID infection only to find that it causes severe liver and gastrointestinal toxicity and oh yeah, it can cause psychiatric problems in a hefty percent of people. Um, you know, we've got um, uh, remdesivir, an uh, antiviral drug that was initially developed for the HIV virus that never got much traction there. It's an old, old drug, it's been around at least 10 years, um, now being um, encouraged for use in uh, COVID, and uh, National Institutes of Health sponsored a study, funded a study to, to study that antiviral. Um, and they terminated the study when they saw that the people on the antiviral drug had somewhat shorter hospital stays. And that received a lot of criticism from the medical community who said you should have continued the study to see if it makes any difference in um, how sick they get and whether or not it's prevents any death. We don't have those numbers. They terminated the study and Gilead Pharmaceutical Company is uh, estimated gonna, gonna spend about $7 billion cranking that thing out and advertising it um, with insufficient studies. Uh, there were a number of, uh, of other Nobel Prizes that were um, based on quote discoveries that were not independently verified and that's still the same kind of thing that goes on today. I'm just going to take a little break there to give Maria a chance to come back on and see if we've generated any questions yet at this point. Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to just go through the questions that were uh, submitted so far. Feel free to mm -hmm. uh, submit more questions um, if you guys are uh, up for it. So the most popular question we got was, what was the motivation to begin this in the first place? And that was sent in by Craig. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you for asking, Craig. Um, you know, um, I started medical school very, very, uh, as a very idealistic person. Again, thinking of the noble profession of medicine. And as a teenager, one of my heroes was, as I mentioned, Albert Schweitzer, um, just a real humanist. Uh, and I, I was really shocked when I went to my medical school interviews and, you know, was asked questions like, well, how much money do you want to make? That's what's going to determine what specialty you're going to go into, you know? And, uh, you know, like, why do you want to be a doctor anyway? And here's me, oh, to help people, you know, to cure people. And they're like, yeah, you better get over that. We don't really help very much. I mean, just the cynicism that I faced was the beginning of um, taking the veneer off of what I thought was this, you know, lofty profession that was, um, you know, really humanitarian at its base. Uh, and then, then in medical school, you know, I saw uh, tremendous um, unethical behavior. For example, uh, right off the bat, uh, Eli Lilly comes into the class. I was at University of Illinois, 350 students per class and uh, gives everybody in the whole class a free stethoscope. I mean, this thing was worth, you know, 150 bucks to us for medical students. Now, free in the short run, yes, but in the long run, this is the beginning of developing a very close relationship with pharmaceutical detail men, meaning the sales reps, right? And um, beginning a lifelong relationship for prescribing the newest uh, drug, maybe for things that they weren't quite FDA approved for, and, um, and giving them in place of generics, which would be just as effective and maybe cheaper. So I saw this going on, and I was one of the very few students among that class, 350 people, who refused the stethoscope. And I, you know, I really started to see what this profession, what characters it's made of. And then as we got into our clinical training, you know, I saw even myself adopt some of the callousness, like instead of saying, Mr. Jones, the guy with the family of six kids who wife's, whose wife comes and visits him every day, we would refer to him as, as, the, as the gangrenous foot on 4 North. You know, he was just a, he was just a black foot to us. Uh, you know, we would call the uh, mental patients, we would call them nutcases, right? We would call people who got transferred from the nursing home into the, you know, into the, through the emergency room to come into the hospital, we would call them GOMERS, acronym for get out of my emergency room. I mean, this is everyday speak in a hospital, and it's not a sitcom. It's, uh, it's a callousness that is is becomes inhumane and again i go back to the words of albert schweitzer who said that when you lose reference uh, reverence for any part of life you lose reverence for all of life and this process was going on in medical school a real erosion uh, and not, not just something that i saw but it was also having an effect on me you know of our ideals when we went when we first went in there and we came, became engrossed in the business of medicine. However, I have to say at the time that I went to medical school, which was 1980 to 1984, I was among the, what I estimate to be the last generation of medical students who was actually taught to evaluate the medical literature, analyze the statistics, uh, really look at potential sources of bias, including uh, overt and more covert conflicts of interest and, and to really look at how things that were being published in the medical literature compared to what was already known and to see if it, if, if it really hung together. And instead today, subsequent generations of doctors have more been trained to do what I call corporate medicine or algorithm medicine. If this, then that. If cholesterol's high, you get Lipitor. That's how come 41% of adult Americans are on a cholesterol-lowering drug, in spite of the statistics which show that for 98% of people, high cholesterol is only a very minor risk factor for cardiovascular death. Um, because it's in the algorithm. Now, who makes up these algorithms? Meaning, you know, if-then protocols. Um, there are various panels who may be attached to a government institution or not, who are, uh, you know, heavily staffed by uh, pharmaceutical 
people connected to the pharmaceutical industry. When it's a physician who's connected, well, we call that pharma whores. And there are a lot of them, especially when you look at the numbers of dollars that are spent in speaking engagements, gifts, freebies, and for doctors to affix their name to an actual ghost-written paper that gets published in the medical literature. So uh, as I progressed through medical school, I became a big patient advocate, to get back to your question, Craig, and um, really realized the need for informed consent and the need for patients to understand where these medical pronouncements decisions, recommendations are actually coming from. People pay attention to this kind of thing when they're faced with a medical crisis in their life, like they have a heart attack and have to decide whether or not to get a stent, or uh, they're faced with cancer and have so many treatment options. And that's when the interest level would go up for the type of things that I talk about. But now everybody's interest level is on who should we believe in the media? I'm not going to diverge off into this particular pandemic, but I hope that by the end of this presentation, especially after you read my book, that you're well on your way to um, cultivating a healthy skepticism yourself for some of these pronouncements. So I hope that answers your question, Craig. You know, along the way, I just found I was I was I was uh, alternately uh, amazed and horrified, and 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 sometimes in disbelief at some of these characters. Um, uh, there's nothing fair about the Nobel Prize. How prizes are determined is uh, by a very, very small committee in Sweden that is the Nobel Prize in medicine. Like I said, the Economics Prize and the Peace Prize actually go through Norway, uh, a committee in Norway. The others are determined in Sweden. And it's a closed door process. In fact, they keep their uh, deliberation notes secret for a period of 50 years. Uh, uh, and that was one advantage for me for studying the Nobel Prize winners so far back is those deliberations are now um, accessible to people who are, who are re researching and you can really see what went on uh, behind the scenes. I'd like to share my screen again to talk about the next notable uh, <laughs> bonehead here and then I'll take some more questions. Is that okay? Yeah. So again, uh, there's black and white pictures of the busts of all these illustrious characters, but I thought this one really did portray the person behind it. And uh, this is uh, Igaz Moniz, who won a Nobel Prize in the 1940s for developing um, what he called orbital leucotomy. Orbital meaning the eye, leucotomy meaning the white matter of the brain. Leuco means white, otomy means to cut into or to, to remove. Uh, later became known simply as lobotomy. Uh, he was a neurologist who also developed a method to visualize the blood vessels in the brain, which we know today as cerebral angiography. We still use it in a, in a, in a way that is very little change from how he developed it. But 20 years later, he veered off into lobotomy to treat mental patients. This is a picture of one of the most famous victims in the world of lobotomy. It's Rosemary Kennedy, the elder sister of uh, JFK. And she was lobotomized as a young adult because um, she, she actually had some mild learning disabilities when she was younger that were so subtle they were, they were hardly noticed until she was in her early teen years. And then like so many other teenagers, she became rebellious. And this was difficult for the family to control at a time when they had great political aspirations and felt like they could not be seen as having a slightly intellectually impaired family member, much less one that was a rabble rouser and a rebellious teenager. So she was subjected to lobotomy and came out of it uh, needing physical therapy for months and months to relearn how to uh, walk and talk and spent the rest of her life in the care of nuns at a convent in uh, Wisconsin until she died in her 60s. And uh, here you see her actually really close to, to the end of her life. Uh, one of the most famous lobotomy patients before that practice was entirely abandoned, but this guy, uh, Igas Moniz, won the Nobel Prize for it. Now, if it's any consolation, he actually couldn't travel to Sweden to get his prize. 
because he was in a wheelchair because an irate former patient had shot him in the spine. So sometimes there is a little poetic justice, huh? <laughs> I'll take a few more questions now. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Lisa. Uh, did Jarek, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, get to keep his Nobel Prize? Uh, thanks for asking, Lisa. That's a really good question. Yes, the thing is that the Nobel Committee never, ever, ever goes back on a decision, even if it's proven within a few months that the prize was erroneously given to the person who maybe really didn't discover the, 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 the subject, uh, or if it was proven to be completely wrong. Uh, for instance, there was one a Nobel winner, uh, Fibiger, who thought that he discovered the cause of stomach cancer to be a particular type of worm. And it was very quickly shown that that was not true. Uh, however, Fibiger himself didn't, wasn't alive long enough after his Nobel Prize to see his great discovery discredited. He actually died from colon cancer, ironically. <laughs> now, funny enough, he was kind of on the right track because although um, this particular kind of worm does not cause stomach cancer, many years later, there was another Nobel Prize that was given for the discovery of a type of bacteria, H. pylori, that uh, infects the stomach and actually does seriously predispose to stomach cancer. And the relationship is so close that we do think it is a causative factor. So he wasn't completely off track, but he was dead wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and like I said, he was dead before he realized he was proven wrong. But the Nobel Committee never, never goes back. Even in later years, it's not in this book, but it'll be in book two, uh, when, when there's been lawsuits that have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that um, the person who got the prize was not the one who discovered the thing. That they, they just don't go back. Uh, and they say that they don't, uh, you know, entertain lawsuits. So lawsuits are brought, but they've never changed their decision based on any lawsuit. Uh, thanks for asking that. Well, maybe we should go on to some brainiacs here. Okay, this is an interesting one. I'm showing here um, on this slide some before and after pictures of, of what happens when somebody is having low thyroid and when it's extremely low to the point that it starts to affect you physically, that's called cretinism. And what we see here on the left side of the slide is uh, two individuals with coarse hair and thick skin and, and large nose, protru protruding lips somewhat. Um, and, and also, um, if you would, you would discover that they were, they were kind of a little bit dull mentally, retaining a lot of fluid. And then on the right side of the slides is the same individuals. You could see the, the hair looks healthier, the skin looks healthier. There's not so much puffiness around the eyes. The lips are less swollen. And this is before and after treatment for low thyroid. One of the winners of the Nobel Prize um, was Emil Theodore Coker. He won the prize in 1909 for his research on the thyroid gland. And what he did was he, it used to be very, very risky to operate on the neck, which is where that gland sits, because you could damage the vocal cords. There's a lot of blood vessels here. You could accidentally poke the trachea. And uh, he really developed what we call clean field technique, which is a way to operate so carefully uh, with such good um, control of bleeding and control of any, you know, chance of infection in the area, clean field surgery, that it was now safe to operate on these big and large thyroid glands called goiters that people used to get. Uh, it was, it, little did we know at that time that simply supplementing the diet with iodine would take care of more than 50% of those goiters. Um, and he was really good at doing an, an extensive surgery and taking the entire thyroid gland out. Well, a few months later, people started to look like this with the thick skin and the dull hair and retaining uh, fluid and protruding lips and drooling and, and being mentally dull. What he had done was rob them of the source of their natural thyroid hormone. And he plunged them into hypothyroidism so severe that many of them became cretins. He was horrified uh, and 
helped uh, research uh, with a lot of other people, helped work with a lot of other people around the world at that time to develop a remedy for this. And he found out that if he could just leave a little snippet of the thyroid gland, like a little corner of it, uh, and just take out the bulk of the, the large thyroid, but leave a little bit, that that would be enough for the person to still have some thyroid hormone. Lacking that, he discovered you could transplant some thyroid hormone under the skin of the patient from a cow or a pig, and that would give them thyroid hormone. And in later years, that was converted to a pill. And still today, Armour Thyroid is made of pig thyroid gland and um, and uh, then there's a synthetic version of that. In fact, it's the most commonly prescribed medication in the United States right now is thyroid hormone. Um, unfortunately, when he went to receive his Nobel Prize and everybody gets an opportunity to make their Nobel speech, this guy completely omitted giving credit to scores of other thyroid researchers. So here he had inadvertently made cretins and then worked double time to figure out how to handle this, but didn't give credit to any of the researchers around the world that helped them. And again, part of this is because of the artifact of the way Alfred Nobel set up his will, stipulating how these prizes would be given to individuals, a maximum of three in any one year, um, but not to, to groups of people. And especially today, most research does happen in groups of people. The other thing about Coker, which makes him both a bonehead and a brainiac, I mean, a brainiac for clean field surgery, for sure. Um, but, you know, a bonehead for making these cretins and not crediting his research, research partners, um, you know, is that he, there was already medical literature out by other researchers going decades back before he created these cretins uh, that did suggest that, hey, the thyroid is not just something like the appendix, like it seems to be doing something metabolically and you've got to be careful before you take it out. In his defense, he didn't have the internet, right? Like I could just go on the internet and see what research has been done in any obscure country. Uh, but still, he was from Switzerland and he knew multiple languages. <laughs> Uh, so that's an example, and there's so many in this book of people that were both, um, you know, brilliant and idiotic at the same time and not great characters in terms of how they professionally and personally conducted themselves and yet made some great discoveries, you know. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I could talk about a lot of things here. Are there any questions? I want to keep this going back and forth. All right, um, let's see. Uh, this is a question from Mike, and I do want to expand uh, on his question. Um, are all the Nobel Prize winners included in this book? Now, I know that you're writing a follow-up to Boneheads and Brainiacs, so uh, is there a Bonehead or a Brainiac who won the Nobel Prize after 1950 you're most excited to cover? Um, well, because I'm just in, <laughs> you know, just, uh, I'd say about a third of the way into that second half of the century. So this book is from 1901 to 1950. Even though it's only 250 pages, it's, um, there's a chapter for every prize. Now there's some years that prizes weren't given because there were more important things going on, like world wars, for example, or some years they didn't find that anybody, uh, really warranted the prize. Um, so it's not exactly 50 years, but it's the first 50 years of the prize. And, um, it's interesting because when I wrote the book, you know, I, or, or after I wrote the book, uh, I wrote a couple blogs on it and say, of course, a lot of uh, the discoveries that were taking place in that first 50 years were about infectious diseases, which to us today, I said in my early blogs, you know, it's not that much of a concern. Well, here we are again. <laughs> and one of the Nobel prizes in the next 50 years is the very first one, 1951, which was given for uh, research on yellow fever. And there was actually an American plague that occurred in um, uh, up, upstream on the Mississippi River. Help me here. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where the um, yellow fever reached up there and emptied out the city and there were actually dead bodies stacking up in the streets. That was That was the the only quote plague that we ever had before the current pandemic, <laughs> uh, you know, on American soil. 
and uh, it would really be wise for people to to study that because some of the things that they were doing before they really understood what was causing it they thought it was something in the air then they thought it was something in the water and then they thought it was you know something on the clothes of the people or something that they were breathing out to people and all along it was transmitted by a mosquito it's a virus transmitted by mosquito as opposed to malaria which is a parasite transmitted by mosquito um and they uh but they, they were doing things like when people would send uh, mail out of the city, they would uh, impre uh, stamp the stamps with a machine that punctured holes in it, and they would impregnate it with carbolic acid, just in case, you know, those lick stamped had some germs on them, you know. So we see a lot of that kind of thing going on today, you know, with uh, wearing masks that, you know, whose pore sizes are 100 times bigger than, than this coronavirus, right? Um, people wearing gloves who aren't medically trained, who are just touching all manner of objects and have been scientifically documented just to be spreading disease, you know what I mean? So people adopt um, kind of strange habits when they don't have full information and they're afraid. And that's what we see happening today. Well, thank you for that question. Um, how about we talk about some brainiacs? <laughs> Some some real heroes, as opposed to some of these scoundrels. Let's see if I can find any here. Oh, this is a whole different thing. Okay, this is great. This is a picture of a person who had tuberculosis of the face. And back in the day, we had no antibiotics for tuberculosis, and it would affect almost every organ, particularly the lungs, but it could also affect the skin with disfiguring lesions, as you see here on the left. And then on the right, you see this person after she was treated. Well, there were no antibiotics for TB until the late 19, well, until about the 1940s. So what, how did she get better? She got better by light therapy. And this was um, developed by Niels Ryberg Finson. And he won the third Nobel Prize for this in 1903. When he was a youngster, his uh, high school uh, principal described him this way, a boy of good heart, but low skills and energy. Not exactly somebody you'd be thinking be winning the Nobel Prize in a few years. But what he realized is that and, and studied and perfected is that light waves of different light of different wavelengths has differing therapeutic properties. And he looked at which wavelengths were good for the skin lesions of smallpox, and which wavelengths were good for the skin lesions of tuberculosis. They were completely opposite. The red light was good for smallpox and the blue wavelength, not ultraviolet, but visible blue was good for the lesions of tuberculosis, as you see here. And smallpox was already on the wane. TB was more of a concern at that time. And his, his uh, light treatments were so uh, effective and popular that Finson Light Institutes popped up all over the world, including in Chicago, New York, California. A lot of times they were um, connected to spas that were in mountainous regions, the idea to be closer to the sun, they gave you full spectrum light. Um, but also people would actually get, um, you know, go to clinics and get light therapies. Here you see a group of children sitting around in nothing but their strange underwear. <laughs> Uh, and then you see the people, you know, dressed in white there, those are the nurses, and they're getting light therapy for tuberculosis or smallpox. Oh, we'll go back to that. Now, the interesting thing about light therapy is that uh, shortly after his Nobel Prize, in the United States anyway, it began to be suppressed. And then when the uh, Food and Drug Administration came into being, they really jumped on it with both feet in conjunction with the American Medical Association to suppress any light therapy. And the idea was that you could go buy a light bulb for 50 cents and paint it or buy a colored light bulb and you could treat all manner of things. Turns out the full spectrum of light has different things which it treats, be they kidney stones, lung problems, skin conditions, infections, whatever. There's a whole science of this and a whole technology that came out of the basic discoveries for which Vincent won his Nobel Prize. Um, but it was embraced by a lot of alternative practitioners because it didn't involve surgery and it didn't involve medications. It's something that 
uh, chiropractors and Ayurvedic physicians and homeopaths and herbalists and things like that could do. In fact, you could read about it and do it in your home. There were some popular books on it. Uh, but some people who, practitioners who did uh, do this actually got uh, hauled off to jail, got their light bulbs seized. And today you could go down to Home Depot and you can buy blue light bulbs, purple light bulbs, red light bulbs for three or four bucks a piece. They're called party bulbs. And, and, uh, in, and yet because of the suppression, there was about a hundred year period there where there was no conventional medical research into um, light therapy and into expanding what Finson won his Nobel Prize for. Now, in just the last 20 years, there's been a resurgence of interest in this and University of Wisconsin uh, uh, Biophotonics lab is, is actually leading the way on this, but there's uh, conventional uh, academic affiliated research institutions around the world that are churning out medical reports on a regular basis these days on the benefits of light therapy in the different spectrums. For example, a light that's orangish, uh, orangish to orangey green is effective if somebody has carbon monoxide poisoning, which affects the lungs, they could just skip uh, slip a little endoscope down the throat with a little um, orangey green light bulb at the end and it improves the healing rate by something like 50 percent healing rate and recovery from carbon monoxide lung damage um, it's being used in cancer therapy where um, a, a drug a, a chemotherapy drug is actually a pro drug in other words it's not active yet the person ingests ingests it or it's given to them by vein uh, and it's just circulating in the, in the system. And then light is applied to the area, such as the liver, let's say, where you want that drug to be active. And only in that location will that drug be active when that wavelength, when the appropriate wavelength of light is, is shined on that. So that's photochemotherapy. There's a whole body of evidence that's just been growing massively in the last two decades, but we lost 100 years of research into this area because of the uh, you know, political suppression by the AMA and our FDA. Um, Finson was another one of those researchers who, who uh, didn't really live to see uh, some of the great benefits that happened uh, with his research. He, he actually died just a couple of years after his prize. And there is now a Finson Institute in his home country, Denmark, but it it's involved in radiation therapy, X radiation, you know, X ray therapy and cobalt therapy and, you know, ionizing radiation therapy for cancer and, and does minimal work actually on the lights, you know, visible light spectrum, unfortunately. Um, the next slide uh, here shows a picture of one of the real heroes that I discovered in researching this book. And this is the guy with the rolled up pants there. Uh, this is Archibald Vivian Hill. And he researched normal exercise physiology. He was a runner and um, he really hung around a lot of athletes and he wanted to find out, you know, how does, uh, how does the oxygen that we take in, you know, get utilized by the cells? How, how do we breathe out carbon, carbon di dioxide? Like what is metabolism all about? How do you optimize human performance? And he was kind of an oddball in that because all the other researchers were winning awards for just, for studying pathology or what's wrong with the body or illnesses. And in fact, he got challenged by an interviewer once, this is reported in a New York Times article, like, why do you study well people? And you know, why do you study athletes? He said, because it's fun. <laughs> you know? And he did it and, and, and the headline ran, read, researcher does it because it's fun. Like, you know, this is an odd thing. But he really was uh, set the, made so many discoveries that, that created the foundation of what we know today is physical medicine and rehab, exercise physiology, sports medicine. And here you see him working with one of his athletes. Like what are the factors that make muscles build faster and make you, make you run faster? And obviously a lot of what he discovered really uh, did translate into helping people who were sick with various things, but he was really studying normal human physiology. Now, the reason he's such a hero in, in my book is because long after he won the Nobel Prize, um, which was in the 20s, he um, became a vocal, um, 
he, he used the, the fact, like a lot of Nobel winners do, of his Nobel winnings and his, prece- his uh, prestige that was generated because of his, his Nobel laureate status to, um, you know, he'd get asked to speak at different places to use those platforms to warn the world about what was coming in Nazi Germany. And as early as 1933, he was pounding on the podium and saying, there are concentration camps in Germany our colleagues who are medical researchers and physicians who happen to be Jewish. And he, he wasn't Jewish, by the way. He was, uh, he was a Christian. He's from England. Um, but he said, you know, our research colleagues are in concentration camps as we speak, 1933, in Germany. And he took a lot of heat for saying that. And it was, uh, he, he really... Uh, lambasted his colleagues for their lack of confront of the evil that was amongst them that was actually going on. It wasn't like he was a conspiracy theorist. He said, there's evidence for it. We could see it. Um, We have people already as early as 1933 fleeing from Germany to academic institutions in America and, and England who would give the most horrific stories. And the scientific world, in large part, just turned a blind eye to that. Of course, a whole bunch of them were eugenicists, and they weren't all from Germany either. The other thing that A.B. Hill did when World War II broke out is he worked for the uh, secret office office, military office in um, England on the uh, subject of radar. So England had a radar system. They're trying to watch for the Luftwaffe coming over the North Sea, hitting their shores. Um, but it didn't work too well in the fog. And what they needed was a, was a better amplifier on it. So he, in, in a blacked out plane, came to America, met with different scientists here. And this was at a time when America wasn't, hadn't yet in, um, joined the Allies in, in World War II. And he convinced them to help him work on improving the radar. Well, it turns out the English had one piece of the technology, the Americans had the other, and they married them up to make a very, very powerful radar that ended up uh, being in use from then on, uh, effectively allowing the English people to detect uh, the German planes so that they could get their air raids going before the bombs were dropped on their country. So he was, he was, he was actually quite literally a war hero. But also, I just loved him as a researcher because he did it because it was fun and studied healthy people. What a concept. (laughs) This is a slide about another of my favorites. This is a drawing of nerves in the brain uh, done, uh, uh, obtained on dissection of actual cadavers. And then they would stain the tissue and then uh, with a dye and actually be able to see under powerful microscopes exactly how nerves look with... uh, branches at the end and then a long stem and then branches at the other end. And this was um, done, these drawings were done by Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was from Spain. The interesting thing about him is that at that time, in the early 1900s, Spain was considered um, not, not scientifically advanced. In fact, the whole country was considered a, a lower order of culture than the more Anglo uh, areas of Europe. And for a Nobel Prize caliber scientist to come from the country was, um, was really remarkable at, in that day, just because of how Spain was regarded, not because there weren't great scientists there, but there was a lot of racism and nationalism going on. Uh, and when Ramon y Cajal won his prize and went to accept it at the festivities in Sweden, see what happens is prizes are announced in October, but they're actually given to the person in December at a big fanfare in Stockholm where the King of Sweden bestows you with your big hunking gold Nobel uh, medal. And you get the opportunity to do a lecture and photo ops and all of that. Um, when he went there, you actually rub shoulders with... Um, the Nobel Prize winners of all the other categories. And he was horrified to be in the same room and rubbing shoulders with the bombastic winner that year of the Nobel Peace Prize, none other than Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt was a very famous um, racist and um, someone who thought that, and I quote, it's quoted in the book, the lower races uh, need to be subjugated by uh, us white folks, 
in order to, to, to you know, bring pros prosperity to the world. And at the time that Cajal won the Nobel Prize and Teddy Roosevelt won it, Roosevelt had, had you know, recently been successful in the Spanish-American War, which was, you know, Spain against the United States. And that was part of his subjugating what he called the lower races. And Cajal was just astounded that such a character could win a Nobel Peace Prize. By the way, just a plug for a colleague's book. There's a book coming out in November that is the Boneheads and Brainiacs of the Nobel Peace Prize. That's not the name of it, but it's a parallel book on the Nobel Peace Prize, whereas I've written about medicine. So look for that book coming soon. You'll see it announced on my website. Um, it's an author from from Norway, which is where the Nobel Peace Prize gets determined. Well, I'm gonna pause here. I've got a lot more interesting characters to talk about, but how about some more questions? All right, this will be our last question of the night since we are uh, running out of time. And it's a short one. Uh, does UN informed consent happen today? And that's by Lisa. I'm sorry, what is the question? Uh, does you does you uninformed and uninformed? I get it. Oh, uninformed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's just all too common. In fact, it's the norm. In other words, somebody goes into the doctor and they get a uh, advice for a test or a treatment or a procedure or you know a drug or a particular surgery or a route of treating cancer or whatever, and they're just sort of uh, you know what's known and not known about. Uh, what the treatment really is, what's known and not, you know, known about how it works, for example, what's known and not known about um, how effective it is, and what are some of the, uh, you know, what are the adverse effects? Again, what's known and not known. Example, uh, the mechanism of action of Ritalin has never been determined. It's never been uh, studied for safety and effectiveness in a controlled study in more than four months. Most kids are on a minimum of nine months per year. Um, you know, there's not a discussion of viable alternatives. And by that, I don't just mean, you know, something that's strictly in the alternative realm, but, you know, what would happen if I tried exercise? What are the statistics on that? What would, what would happen if I just didn't take this medicine? Well, you know, chances are you would do just as well. <laughs> like, you know, COVID, you know, what percent of people who actually, whose bodies actually meet the virus survive. And if we really had a correct denominator on it, most epidemiologists are now assuming that that's something like 99% of people. So no need to drink quinine water or anything crazy like that. So yes, unfortunately, uninformed consent, in other words, being glib about being given a glossy, a, a gloss over of uh, what's really known about the treatment that they're suggesting or this test or study, you know, like the incidence of perforation when somebody goes for their screening colonoscopy. Be nice to know that, how many people ever get told of that. Or the excess incidence of um, breast cancers in this country if, you actually, if everybody in the country actually would adhere to the recommended schedule for mammograms. We're generally not told that when we're advised to get a mammogram. So unfortunately, uninformed consent is the rule of the day. There's a lot of interesting things in this book, among other things, the discovery of DDT won a Nobel Prize. And here you see how enthusiastic America was about applying DDT. Here it's being sprayed on a pool of school kids. It was also sprayed in populated uh, school cafeterias, among other places. It's still persisting in the environment to this day. You'll also learn that the discovery of penicillin, we all learned in fourth grade that Alexander Fleming made this uh, amazing discovery. Uh, but it turns out it was simply a rediscovery of something that had been written up by a medical student at the Pasteur Institute in the 1800s. Uh, you learn other interesting things. I put all of the uh, scientific nomenclature and explanations in, in language for the ordinary reader. And one of the things you learn is illustrated here that chlorophyll, for instance, on the in the green there, is this circular molecule with magnesium in the middle of it. And that's, that's the breathing mechanism for plants. Whereas on the right side, you see the oxygen carrying mechanism for humans, which is hemoglobin. It's the exact same molecule with one change. Instead of having magnesium at its center, it has iron at its center. Very interesting. Um, I'd like to 
let you read more about informed consent and how to cultivate your own healthy skepticism by tuning into uh, my Smart Med Info blog. Of course, what everybody wants to know about these days is the virus, but there is other information there on other things like cholesterol medications, acid reducing medications, psychotropic medications, and others. Um, and then there's also a Nobel blog, and you can you know just read about some of the things that make a book about the Nobel Prize in Medicine pertinent today and what current Nobel winners are, are up to, including many who are commenting, uh, commenting on COVID, whether or not that's their area of specialty, but hey, they got the big Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> so I hope I leave you with, um, you know, an interest in the book and also just, uh, you know, an understanding that an ordinary non-medical person can really use your own uh, judgment and discernment to, you know, sort out who you should really use as an opinion leader and who you should trust when you're navigating the field of uh, medical treatment. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dolan, for uh, taking the time to do your presentation and to answer questions. It was really lovely having you. And thank you to all of you who tuned in this evening. Uh, you guys are the lifeline of independent bookstores everywhere. Again, uh, please consider purchasing a copy of Dr. Dolan's book, Boneheads and Brainiacs. Uh, you can just click on the green button below the viewer screen and it will take you to our website where you can uh, continue your checkout process. Also, oh, please support your independent bookstore. I, I have to admit, um, before I was self-published three books before this one and now with the publisher on this one, I never, as a consumer, never really appreciated the cru crucial role that independent bookstores play in um, forwarding books and forwarding new ideas and forwarding, you know, authors. I mean, pr getting information out in such a, a, a diverse way without corporate influence is the mission of independent bookstores. Please support your local bookstore. Don't click on the Amazon thing, even though I saw it. <laughs> um, and again, we're going to be doing more virtual events. So if you'd like more regular updates on our upcoming events, uh, make sure to follow us on our Crowdcast channel and also to subscribe to our newsletter. All right. Great evening and stay safe, everyone. Right. Thanks, guys. Bye.